this morning uh, before dawn, this gentleman over here that's taking a picture of me, uh, he and I went up to go run on the beach out in Surf City. And as we walked out the door in the dark, I've got a flashlight, that was the doormat on our way out the door. So I thought it was very appropriate for today and an indicator of uh, keeping your eyes open because opportunities are in front of you that you might not even know. I'm going to try and do this without my glasses. Hopefully it will work. Yeah, I went too far. Back up. Okay, so I'm a big believer in perspective. And everything that I talk about comes from the perspective of being a male Army infantry officer. Okay, so when I talk about veterans, a lot of times I say he. Unintentionally, I don't mean to exclude any female veterans. And I'm not sure exactly why it is, but back in 1983 when I went through ranger school, rangers were the only people in the military that said hua. And now... Everybody says HUA, except the Marine Corps puts an R in the middle. The Navy drops the H on the, I mean, everybody's got this weird way of saying HUA, but it's just an indicator of the different language that comes from different perspective, different service. So uh, you're in for a little bit of Army training as we go through this. Yesterday, everybody had to brag about their military experience, so they showed pictures of them in uniform early on. So now I'm giving my age away because I was almost three years old when this was taken. I don't know how many of you got your hands on a BAR when you were two, a little over two and a half. Uh, my father, who ultimately retired from the Army as a sergeant major, left my family when I was four. So about another year down the road from this. And some of that will play into what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that now, but it was important developmentally. Um, who am I and why should I be talking to you? So those of you that maybe recognize the guy with the four stars on his beret, that's Joe Votel. Joe and I were very briefly captains together in the 1st Ranger Battalion back in 1990 to 93 time frame. And then about a month after he got there, he made major. I worked for him. Uh, I quit the Army and left, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. I left and abandoned him and his role as the executive officer of the 1st Ranger Battalion, and I went out to become a civilian. And on 9-11... He was the commander of the 75th Ranger Regiment, and in October of that year, he parachuted into Afghanistan with the 3rd Ranger Battalion. And that started the process of me reconnecting with that community. It took 10 years from the time that I left active duty until I really reconnected with the community and started understanding, seeing and understanding the problems that were happening within that community of people that I'm very, very close to. And now he's the CENTCOM commander. He just took command, just changed command yesterday. So those connections, I'm able to use that to leverage. Uh, I, I, we certainly don't get any special privileges or special treatment, but I have access. I, about the time that Nick and I, when, when uh, Nick was talking about right when Raider Project was starting up and we had that suicide, and we had the active duty suicide or near suicide, I forget which one it was now, I sent him an email and I said, hey, Joe, Red Star Cluster, we need to talk. And he called me within 15 minutes. We had a brief conversation. I said, we got an issue. We need to get this issue corrected. These amazing, outstanding warriors are under so much stress and pressure, they're not getting the support from the system, and they're killing themselves. So talk a little bit more about that in a minute. My very first interview when I left active duty was with a huge privately held company that's headquartered in Wichita, Kansas. And I'm sitting across the table from a human resource manager. My last job on active duty, I was the assistant S3 of the 1st Ranger Battalion. That is a freaking awesome job, let me tell you what. Being a company commander in an infantry battalion is one better than that, and I got to do that before I was that. Um, but I'm sitting across from this human resource manager, and she looks at my resume, and she says, hmm, Army officer, you know, you guys are real good at following orders and doing what you're told, but here at this company, we need people that have initiative, think outside the box, and don't need constant supervision. <laughs> I was so insulted, I just packed up my stuff and left. And I swore I'm never going to work for a company that has that kind of an attitude because that's just that's idiocy, that they're turning their backs on the people that can have the most impact on the company. They're doing just fine now, even without me. I kind of hoped that they would go under, but that did not happen. Uh, let's talk a little bit about learning. Many of you may recognize some of these from your past. Maybe this is how you learned and you got feedback about certain things. Uh, when you move into the world of transition from military service to civilian life, 
You don't get feedback. You don't have somebody dropping you for push-ups because you didn't get up and do PT that morning or because you drank too much the night before or your resume isn't good enough. So feedback has to come in a number of different ways. One of the greatest examples that I can give you of knowing ahead of time what's coming, and I'm going to talk about that as we get a little further into the presentation, is things that happen to you when you're in the military, you're not the first person that it's ever happened to. When you went through basic training and you learned how to react to an ambush, you know what happened? They put you in a set of bleachers, they walked you through, this is what it is, they may have enacted it for you, then they had you go out onto a flat field and you walked through, react to an ambush, and then as you gained in proficiency, they started adding trees, and then they added blanks, and then maybe you did it at night, and then you did it in a protective mask, and they did it with live ammunition. But you, you learned all of this stuff so that the first time that you get walk into an ambush, you know exactly what to do. And you're not sitting there going, oh, let me pull out the book and, oh, okay, react to ambush, here's step one. You know, by that time, you're dead. Uh, sustained airborne training. How many of you are paratroopers, ever jumped out of an airplane? Okay, a few of us, good. Um, I have a metal hip because I used to do this. But one of the things that happens before, at least in the Army, I, I don't know if you do it in the Marine Corps, before every jump you have to go through sustained airborne training. And you get everybody in a big formation and you get it double interval and the jump master stands up on a PT stand and he walks you through all of the things that might go wrong during that jump. So you refresh and rehearse and go through all of this. One of the things is, what do you do if you're landing on another jumper's canopy? Has anybody ever had the privilege of landing on another jumper's canopy? What do you do in sustained airborne training when the jump master says, what do you do? You jog in place, right? So you're standing there with 100 other people jogging in place, feeling this is dumb as hell. Why am I doing this? And then you go on to the next thing. Well, mass attack, ranger regiment, it was a regimental jump. Fortunately, it was daylight, so I could see uh, Fort Benning, Georgia back in 1992. And opening shock as I come out of the aircraft, I'm still swinging underneath the aircraft, and I land on another jumper's canopy. I mean, just flat on my back on a canopy. And it's like being in a kid's moonwalk. I had no idea that you would actually be able to stand up and walk off the canopy. All of the suspension lines pooled. They were in a big, it was like somebody took a five-gallon thing of spaghetti and dumped it in my lap. And as I sit up, I see my parachute. It just kind of slides off the canopy, and it's gone. And I'm not even thinking about, we, we jump 800 feet normally, so you don't have a whole lot of time to react to this. So I grabbed a bunch of suspension lines, threw them that way, grabbed a bunch, threw them that way, remembered where my parachute was, ran after it, jumped off, thankfully missed the parachute, came down, pulled a slip as hard as I could away from the other jumper, and I'm looking back thinking, I want to know who that is, and all I remember now are eyes that are like this big looking back at me. I have no idea who it was. And, and as I'm coming down, I see great big sand piles, so I pull a slip right into the sand pile. And I hit with force that probably would have broken my legs or my back, except I hit in sand, so it, it was a safe landing. And as I immediately roll over, because the adrenaline causes you to feel like you're going to throw up, a general runs by, and he's like, oh, good training, and he just keeps right on going. <laughs> but th the point about that whole thing is, if I didn't know, if somebody hadn't done that sometime before and said, hey, this is how you survive, you run off the parachute, then I never would have rehearsed it a hundred times before I went to jump. I wouldn't have known what to do. I'd have sat there on the parachute and I go, holy crap, I'm sitting on this guy's parachute. What am I going to do? But I'm, I'm alive and mostly whole because somebody taught me how to do that. Again, military transition, that just doesn't happen. So I'm going to tell you about some of the things that I have seen. This is after action review type stuff for military transition. Things that I have seen and it's a little busy slide, so I apologize for that, but let's start over on your left. You got a guy popping a wheelie on a motorcycle, talking on a cell phone. I mean, you're on active duty, things are rocking and rolling, you can do dangerous things, and you can do them very well because you've been trained, you're part of a team, things are going really, really well. And then you ETS, or you leave, you separate. How many people can say a positive term for leaving the military, besides retirement? Separation, right? Is that a positive term? Discharge, positive term? I challenge you. you. You can't really find a positive term for leaving the military. So let's start with end term of service. You run into a few problems with getting a good job. The expectations that were set for you at the ACAP program or the TAP program or whatever it is that the particular branch of service you, go, you belong to calls their transition program. They fill you full of some great ideas, some very high expectations. 
and you're in a comfortable environment, you're with people you know, and then they kick you out the door and you go to a foreign land where you have no reinforcements, you're all by yourself, you're like an individual replacement back in the Vietnam War. You either fly or die on your own. You figure it out or you don't figure it out. And it didn't work very well in Vietnam, and it's not working very well right now with transition. So you have money problems. If you see on the top there that the hope line, the more of these obstacles that you run into, that hope line starts diminishing. You start running out of hope. On the other side, that isolation line starts growing because if you're running into jobs, job problems or money problems or relationship problems, then what happens? You start isolating, you start retreating, you, you stay up at night and you're on the computer instead of getting all of the sleep that you need, as we heard a speaker talk about yesterday, it's so important to get that sleep. You're sacrificing the sleep, you're isolating, you're pulling yourself in and everything keeps closing in and the problems get greater and greater and greater. The, uh, Alcohol plays a huge role in there, self-medication. The VA may help a little bit, or they may do things that are completely opposite and make the problems worse. And I think we're going to have a speaker later that talks about that. As you progress through this continuum, there's one way at the bottom that it can end, and that's underneath a tombstone with a military marker on it. So I want to tell you a little story about the, the headstone here. I told you earlier that my father left when I was four ultimately retired as a sergeant major. I did not know him until I was an adult. I never saw him from the time that I was four years old until I was 20. His father, three war infantrymen, World War II, Korean, Vietnam. That's Phil Vodder. That's my grandfather. Undiagnosed post-traumatic stress, probably undiagnosed TBI. He self-medicated with alcohol. Early in my father's life, he threw my father out of the house. Said, get out, get on your own poisoned the relationship between the two of them. He died in 1977 in Denver in a men's shelter alone. All his possessions fit in a shoebox. I never met the man. Somebody do the math. 77 to 17, is that 40 years ago? We still haven't figured it out. The same exact things are happening with some of you, and we haven't figured it out. We've got to share the information. We've got to say, you know what? When you start running into a problem getting a job where your expectations aren't being met, you're going to want to feel like you need to isolate, or you're going to want to feel like you need a drink before you go to sleep. You see where that line goes. You end up like my grandfather. But if you can go, oh, crap, I recognize that I'm, I just had an argument with my significant other, and if he or she leaves then suicide is like the next thing. I've got to send up a Red Star Cluster and ask for help right now. Or early on. I'm having a little trouble with the job. I'm, I'm starting to feel like I don't fit in. I don't know anybody in this community. Send up a Red Star Cluster. I need a little bit of help. Each of you has to do that because if you don't, you're the individual replacement sitting in Vietnam, unable to call for reinforcements, got no ammunition, can't call an airstrike, and what happens? You can't overcome that. You, you have to... Get back with the team. You have to become part of the veteran community. You have to ask people, how did you do it? Because you can help me get through that. This is the way military transition goes. You can do the most awesome, dangerous, cool stuff. And then when you leave, nothing goes right. One of my favorite things to do while I was on active duty was nightland navigation. And I know that sounds kind of stupid, right? Because nightland navigation is a pain in the butt. You're walking through spider webs. you got branches hitting you in the eye. You're falling down in ditches that you can't see are there because it's totally dark. You're in the forest. But it's a true test of your ability to work a map and compass and to follow an azimuth, right? And so how many people have done nightland navigation? Right? Probably just about everybody in this room. So what happens? Somebody says, I want you to follow this azimuth for this distance and then write down the point where you're going to find your objective, whatever it is that you're looking for. So you go dial in your asthma, if you line up the little glow-in-the-dark dots, hopefully they glow, right? So you start following that, and when that spider web hits you and you take a couple of steps back, you've got to remember, did I go left or did I go right? And when you hit a tree, you've got to go right, and then the next tree, you've got to go left. And if you're going 100 meters and you're off that asthma a couple of degrees, you go, oh, my pace count, i got my, pace, my ranger pace count cord here too. Uh, I've hit my 100 meters, let me look around for my point, and you'll probably find your point okay. But if you stay off azimuth a couple of degrees and you're going 10 clicks, what's the odds that you're going to find what you're going for? 
pretty damn slim, right? Military transition is the same way. You go through your ACAP program, that's your, that's your azimuth. And they send you out to the community to go learn how to become a civilian again. You start walking that azimuth and you're going into night land navigation. And when you run into a job obstacle or a relationship obstacle or a money obstacle, you start bumping a couple of degrees off that azimuth. If you go out six months and recognize that there's an issue and you've got to get back on azimuth, or if you get connected with us and we can connect you with a veteran that lives nearby that has already transitioned, can sit down with you over a cup of coffee and say, let's see what we need to do to get you back on azimuth, you get back on azimuth pretty quick, right? But if you go off azimuth for 10 years, we've been at war, the end of this year it's going to be 15 years. If you've been off azimuth for 10 years, we're talking a significant emotional investment for a lot of people to get you back on azimuth. And that's what we deal with now a lot, is people that are relationships are in shambles, they've got eight kids by five different partners and they're paying child support everywhere, they got no money. I mean, we've got to stop that going off azimuth out for 10 years, we've got to interrupt it, we've got to stay on azimuth from the time we leave military service until the end of life. Mike's gonna talk a little bit about, about transition and how long it takes for you to transition. That's something that we can interrupt right now today. And if you know somebody that's off azimuth, Throw up that, throw a smoke grenade, throw a red star cluster, do something to tell them, let's get back on azimuth. I talked about finding a veteran in your, in your local area to help you get back on azimuth. I want to talk through a couple of the transition lessons that I personally went through. And the first one actually happened when I was still on active duty. That set of dog tags there, that's World War I. And Roy Jones was my grandmother's brother okay, on my mom's side, so the other side of the family from the World War II grandfather. And I inherited Roy's canteen cup and a couple other things and his rifle, which is all pretty cool. Um, but the first time that I came home on leave from active duty, he was at whatever family gathering it was, and I don't remember right now if it was 4th of July or whatever the event was, but we had a big family picnic and we're at my grandmother's house. And Uncle Roy and I find ourselves sitting by ourselves under the patio just kicking back after the barbecue. And he starts telling me stories about World War I. And, and some were funny, some were a little sad, but he's telling me these amazing stories about World War I. So then later that afternoon, I'm helping my grandmother with something, and, she sa and I said to her, wow, how about that story where he was in the shell hole and he could hear his buddy crying out for help and he kind of counted the rounds and went and drug the guy over. And she said, what? He did what? He had never told her. I mean, this is... They're both now 75, almost 80 years old, and he had never told her, and they lived not too far apart, he never told anybody in the family the story. But he felt he could tell me because now I'm a veteran, so I'm an infantryman. We've worn the same uniform, although it's different color, different shape over a different number of years, but cross-generational, cross-conflict, uh, an infantryman from World War I and an infantryman from Desert Storm all of a sudden had a great connection and they could communicate. Same thing happens Marine to Marine, same, things ha thing, same thing happens with an Air Force person to an Air Force person. So lesson number one is that, that um, brotherhood is cross-generational. Lesson number two, when I left active duty, after I had that amazingly disappointing interview with that big company that thought I was going to be of no use to them, my brother-in-law's father introduced me to a guy that owned a 7-Up bottling company. Didn't have any jobs opening, but he said, now maybe you should go sit down with this guy and network. So I sit down and I talk to this gentleman, his name is John. And as I'm talking to John, I find out he's a Korean War infantryman. So now we're talking infantryman to infantryman. And I had put pencil to paper, and I knew this was 1993, with the money that I'd saved up from leaving the military, I expected, I knew my bills were going to be this amount, my wife wanted to go to college, I needed $25,000 a year to pay all the bills, to make everybody happy. Not a lot of money. So I sit down with him, and 10 minutes into our discussion, he says, so what would it take to hire you? I like to think I'm pretty quick on my feet, so I said $30,000. And he said, done. And I'm thinking, well, crap. <laughs> I probably could have asked for more money than that. So the, the lesson number two there is networking works. Talk to people that know people. Go sit down with them. Talk about what you want to do, what your transition is, and opportunities come. I didn't go there looking for a job. I went there because this was somebody that I had a connection with that could maybe introduce me to some other people. Lesson number three on there, it's a little hard to read with the lights, but that's the money thing. Know what you're worth, not necessarily what you need. 
They might be two entirely different things, but understand the value of what you could bring to an organization out there. And it doesn't matter who you talk to or what organization you talk to, when you look at your skill set, and I'll be glad to help have that discussion, and I can connect you with others that can help have that discussion, we'll figure out what you are worth, what you could be worth. And most of that is what can you bring to the organization. So with that discussion, now you have a basis to start to have a little bit of leverage to talk about your salary. Uh, fourth one on there is culture check. So as I went to work at the 7-Up Bottler, assistant S3 of the 1st Ranger Battalion, I'm a senior captain. When I walked into a room, odds are everybody else was going to stand up because there were only about half a dozen people that outranked me in the unit. And I get to the 7-Up Bottler, and my first job was safety and training director. So I'm going out to the production line. I got the vice president of operations smoking a cigarette over open bottles of 7-Up going down the line. I'm like, oh my God, sir, you can't do that. Put out the cigarette. And he's looking at me like, who are you to tell me you know, what I can or can't do? And then I go into the bottling room, and there's guys in there not wearing their iPro, and they're pressurizing bottles of 7-Up. One of those bottles is going to explode. Somebody's going to lose an eye. So I'm telling these guys, put on your iPro. You have to do that. And they're telling me to go screw myself. I mean, it, it was such a culture check. I didn't understand what I was getting into. And after doing that for a year and a half, I'd been promoted twice. Now I'm distribution director for a state and a half of this organization. But I am going to leave, and I'm going to leave angry, or they're going to fire me, and I'm going to leave angry. But one way or the other, I was going to leave that company. And if I left that company without getting the benefit and advice of another veteran to help me out, that new business, I would repeat it because I wouldn't know what I was walking into. And if you do that two or three times, now you have a toxic resume, and who's going to want to hire you? And that's happening to us right and left. So I was very fortunate in that uh, I got a guide. That guide was a, a gentleman named Bill Cooper. And Bill and I had gone to high school together. I knew he was going to be my best friend, actually, in the eighth grade when I'm sitting in a choir room, and he's got a kid in a headlock under the grand piano, and he's just beating the crap out of him. So like, that guy's going to be my best friend. So Bill and I both went into ROTC together. He took five years to graduate from school. I took four. So I went in early. I went Airborne Ranger, light infantry route. He went leg, mech, armor, that kind of stuff. He knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to command a mech company in Europe. He did that. He got out. He knew what he wanted to do on his transition side. He went back to Kansas. And now he's running a branch of an of a equipment company, dealing with Case and Ingersoll Rand and that kind of stuff. He had started there as the service manager, worked his way up to be a sales guy, and now he's the branch manager. So he takes me to lunch, and he says, I want you to come work in my company. He knew that I was frustrated where I was, and he could see what was going to happen if something didn't interrupt this process. So he's trying to talk to me about coming and being a salesman for him. I'm like, Bill, I don't know construction equipment. I don't know sales. I don't have a very good opinion of salesman because I bought a car before. And it sounds like a recipe for disaster if I were to come work for you. And this is the importance of the guide. He said, you know what? I can teach sales. I can teach the iron. What I can't teach is discipline and integrity and the ability to learn. You bring that. You've demonstrated that in the military. If you bring that to this organization and you learn what I teach you, you're going to do fine. And that's what happened. And I spent most of the rest of my professional career before Gallant Few uh, working in the construction equipment field. These are some of those after action review comments that I talked about before that you need to know. What I want you to understand is these things that some of you are going through right now, you're not the first person to ever go through them. There are a million veterans that have gone through those things. And some of them live within a mile of your house and where you decide to go live. Some of them are going to live within a mile of your future home. You got to connect, you got to get their information, you got to network. You've got to find them so that they can help you walk through these things. Um, what you've got to avoid is the greatest thing at the bottom, and that's isolation. When you've isolated and you think about in the military, if you're all by yourself and you're cut off behind enemy lines and the only thing you've got left is to call in fire on yourself, then that's suicide. And that's what happens on the transition side if you let it go that far. The greatest asset a special operations warrior, a warrior has, is their mind. It's the strongest weapon in your arsenal. When you transition, guess what can be the greatest threat to your transition? Your mind, right? It'll work against you. You can't let it work against you. 
Okay, I gotta tell a couple of quick stories because these are really, really important. One of the concepts that I talk constantly about is response ability. You have the ability to choose your response to any situation that you find in front of you. And I'm gonna tell this quick story about Dr. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I got to meet him twice, heard him talk a couple of times. Phenomenal, phenomenal speaker. Um, he told this story about going into a coffee shop. He liked to go there every Friday morning. He'd have a cup of coffee. He'd read his paper, kind of plan out what he was going to do for the next week. And that was his way of relaxing and unpacking the week. Well, this particular morning, there's this little kid in there. And this kid is running around, creating noise, knocking things over, just being an absolute pain. And the dad is just staring off into space, not doing anything about this little butthead kid. And Cubby says he got madder and madder and madder. And finally he said, sir, do you understand that your kid is disrupting everybody we're trying to have a cup of coffee, read my paper, can't do it because your kid is being a butthead? And, you know, I don't, I don't know how you feel about it, but right now I want to take that little kid and like hang him up on a hook somewhere. The guy looks at Covey and he kind of comes back from outer space and he says, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I just came from the hospital. Kid's mom's going to die, my wife. I don't know what we're going to do. What went through your mind when that story changed? I know my reaction is, give me the kid. We'll color. I'll tell him a story. You know, we'll go do something. What, what can I do to help you? There was a switch that flipped in my mind the first time I heard that story. Probably a switch that flipped in your mind. You can activate that switch anytime you want to by learning how to control that switch. My grandparents, my grandma's brother, Roy Jones, I, I told you about there, bottom right. When I get into a car, everybody else on the road automatically becomes the stupidest people on the planet. They drive too fast, drive too slow, cut me off, don't signal, violate all traffic rules, and I feel like I want to let them know how displeased I am with their ability to drive a car. So I'll let them know. It's probably not the best thing to do on the road, right? So after I heard Covey tell the story, I thought, I wonder if there's something that I can do to change my behavior. So now when I get in the car, I go, oh, my grandparents are with me in the car. So when I drive, you know, I'm not going to do hand and arm signals or yell obscenities at somebody that's out there. If my grandparents are in the car with me, it just it, it immediately changes my perspective. Nothing else changes. The people are still buttheads. I'm still driving the same car, but my reaction to it has changed. You have the ability to choose that response. These are areas that Gallant Few talks about. We've got responsibility, uh, self-training and responsibility is the core focus of our approach to transition. And each one of those areas, social, spiritual, emotional, professional, and physical, have wellness areas that we work through. Physical wellness, hey, I got up this morning before the crack of dawn with Mike Schlitz, and we went out and ran. If Mike hadn't said, hey, do you want to run in the morning? There's no way I would have run this morning. <laughs> having somebody, having that accountability partner, somebody to hold you to it, and, and when you got a guy with no arms that says, hey, you want to run with me? You go, okay, I'll go run with you. Emotional wellness, you think you are the only person going through what you're going through. And the reality is everybody else is going through the same thing. But we're so good at covering ourselves up. We're so good at putting on that facade that nobody else can see what we're going through. We can't see what they're going through. So you think I'm the only one that's got a problem. And that's not the truth. Spiritual wellness and play. I've got one. Now, how many of you have seen the movie The Jerk? I won't tell you what his special purpose was. But that's your challenge is to find your purpose. And I'll talk about that here real quick in a second. Professional wellness, how do you manage your money? How do you connect with other people? All those things. The important thing here is as you go through your transition is not to become who you're going to be by accident. You want it to be intentionally. Just like when you went in the military, you had a plan. Somebody gave you that plan, but you followed that plan. A lot of us, when we transition, we don't have a plan, so it's all totally by accident. There's a martial arts saying that paper stacked a sheet at a time will ultimately reach the sky. Physical fitness, emotional wellness, social, professional wellness, all of those things, when you follow that plan, that's putting a sheet of paper on that stack, and it ultimately leads to success. If you're doing the wrong things, guess what? 
You have to take them off of that stack and put them on the other stack before you can ultimately lead to success, but at the end of it, you will. Our mission is prevent veteran isolation by connecting new veterans with hometown veteran mentors that are very much like themselves and facilitate a peaceful and successful transition to civilian lives filled with purpose and hope. How many of you have heard of the Spartan Pledge? Heard Boone Cutler talk about the Spartan Pledge? I will not take my life by my own hand until I call my battle buddy first and I will make it my mission to find a mission to help my warfighter family. You can change battle buddy to ranger buddy to swim buddy to whatever your branch of service calls it. But what is crucially important and what's on the back side of every one of my business cards is a copy of this pledge. And it has a line on there where you write your buddy's name in there and his or her phone number. And they need to have access to you. You need to take this pledge because it keeps people alive. And it doesn't say I'm not going to kill myself. I mean, that's the, the highest single act that you can do for yourself, or the lowest, depending on how you feel about it. But it's the one choice that nobody else can make for you. I'm not saying don't kill yourself. What I'm saying is don't kill yourself before you call your buddy. Because when you call your buddy, guess what? You're reminded that you're valued, that you're loved, that they need you on the earth. And then you're not going to kill yourself. Think about who of your buddies you have not spoken to in the last six months, 12 months, two years. Call them up. Let them know how much you love and respect them because you don't know what they might do tonight. And you don't want to be the guy that reads on social media tomorrow that so-and-so took their life when it was on your mind to give them a call. So make sure that you reach out. All of this stuff that Gallant Few does is all from the community. I've said from the beginning, when Nick and I first started talking, what we do has to be of the community, by the community, and for the community. Because nobody else is going to look out for us but ourselves. We have to look out for ourselves. We have to share what works. We have to warn ourselves against what doesn't work. Because the system that's out there, the communities that are out there, the joining forces, the, all the programs that are out there, they don't give a crap about you individually. But your brothers and sisters who wore the same uniform, who experienced the same training, who did the same things, they love you. Even if you haven't met them yet, even if they're from a different generation, you have to go out there. You've got to find them. You've got to connect to them. My contact information, I've got a pile of business cards on this table. Back in that corner, there are more piles of business cards. Um, you have snap links laying on your table that's got a, a compass on there. Take that and remember that you've got to find, you've got to follow your azimuth. And you've got to make sure that your buddy is following their azimuth. And if you see somebody going off azimuth, and probably every one of you right now can think of somebody that you know that's off azimuth. It's our responsibility to get them back on azimuth because we don't want them ending up like my grandfather did. 